For a topic like sustainable finance, and let's be honest, in asset management, the growth is in four areas. The growth is in sustainability, the growth is in data science, the growth is in fintech, although fintech is risky, can also kind of burst the bubble, and then the growth is in regtech. Regulation is not entirely cool. Most people don't want to just grow in regulation, although I'll explain you a lot of it afterwards, of course. Sustainability is very cool, and data science is very cool. But then when you think about it from a marketplace Riga, whenever you leapfrog someone, you will have to have a narrative. You will have to explain why you managed to leapfrog when no one else did. And so if I may offer you, I, internationally in Dublin, would immediately believe why Riga managed to leapfrog on sustainable finance, because the vice president running is a Latvian one. Right? So it kind of makes sense that it's a better connection. When we gave the talk, um, so we do these work shows around the world, and I joined Sean Kidney, who can't be here today, but sends his best regards, in Beijing, and I joined him in Hong Kong. And when we spoke at the Beijing uh, Environmental Exchange, we had senior Chinese leadership, we had two Luxembourg embassy representatives, one from Germany, one from France, one from Britain, none from Sweden, but we had the Latvian one. So, <laughs> I think there is quite an opportunity uh, to see that as a leapfrog <coughs> aspect where you can work with. So, the technical expert group, maybe one question before I go into detail, and this pen is not the strongest. Uh, who has heard about the way European legislation works with level 1 or level 2? Anyone? Okay, so European legislation works on two levels at least, and then there's more complexities. So, the first level is a level where the council and the parliament make proposals. So the council makes a proposal and the parliament makes a proposal and then these proposals have to be agreed in a so-called trialogue. So as a technical expert group, we have four areas that we're working on. We have the area of corporate disclosure. Marie will talk about that later. We have the area of green bonds. We have the area of benchmarks. we have taxonomy and the first two don't actually have level one legislation so that means we're basically aiming to form political power but we're not at the stage yet that we have level one legislation that can immediately shape things the latter two have level one legislation and for the benchmarks the level one legislation is already agreed now the challenge with this level one legislation is that normally the level two legislation, which means the practical, the how to do it, is done afterwards. So normally, the council and the parliament agree on legislation, and then basically there's a trial of that sorts out both proposals into one. And then ESMA, for instance, gets 18 months or so to write the exact details. Now, with a technical expert group, the European Union and Dobrovskis have decided to change this and say, we're doing the level two legislation in parallel. So we use the level one legislation from the council and then we tell all these technical experts that we get in from all of Europe to actually work on the level two legislation once the level one legislation is finalized. Now, I didn't realize that when I applied for the technical expert group. I only realized that when I was there. And I didn't even realize that not everything had legislation. And so we wrote an interim report in the benchmarks for what I'm in, and we had it ready, and then we get told, oh, sorry, the parliament doesn't like the level one legislation. So basically, your marching orders that the council gave you, but the parliament doesn't want it. And then we ask our European Union minders, the people that help the experts organize everything, so what does that mean? Yeah, it kind of means that you're gonna get new marching orders. And then we ask them, how new? And they said, could be entirely new. And we're like, you're joking. We'll come in here two days a month, every month, spend a lot of time arguing with each other, and you're gonna give us completely new marching orders? Well, it's not us, it's the parliament. But how can that work? So, as it turns out, we are waiting for the Parliament and the Council to agree. And while we're waiting, one of the MPs, a British MP, was actually arrested in Belgium because she invaded a US Air Force base protesting against nuclear. So, and this was the MP, not a helper of the MP. So that gives you a sense of what kind of MPs are negotiating there. So the MPs are very forceful. And so they then agree on uh, their plan for benchmarks and they came out and we now have agreed upon benchmark plans and these benchmark plans are quite revolutionary. Who is working in asset management? Three, okay. And maybe I get a general, who is an issuer? Corporate. 
Financial institutions. Okay, well, let's do the following for me, just for me to understand to target the talk. Who is working with a financial institution? Can I get a show of hands? Okay, who is working with a non financial corporate? So, what are the other people? Who's working with a ministry? <laughs> I must be missing something. What are you lobbies. guys working with? Lobbies. Lo uh, all lobbyists? Central banks. Central banks. Who's with the government or the central bank or something? Quick show of hands. Okay, all right, seems to be a relatively good thing. So, the, the index, um, so the indexes, very simple question. Now, who knows the MSCI world? The index. Most, okay. So, the MSCI world is a main equity index based on this new legislation, if sold in Europe, will have to, dis have to disclose on environmental, social, and governance issues. <laughs> Every index, not only the ESG indexes, will have to disclose on environmental, social, and governance issues. The only indexes that will not have to disclose on it are currency and interest rate indexes. So that <coughs> means that even a crude oil index, if sold in Europe, will have to disclose at the minimum that they don't think the carbon footprint of a crude oil index matters. Which, th that's probably what they're going to disclose, unless putting the full carbon footprint up. But so, we, we're going to have a pretty significant push for much more transparency. And then, besides this, we have two initiatives outside the tech, which is an eco-label and the investor disclosure. But I think, given the audience, I start with what's called the green taxonomy. So the green taxonomy is the idea that we're going to have each activity classified as being green or not being green. We have six ambitions, which are climate change mitigation, climate change adaptation, healthy ecosystems, and so forth. And on the six ambitions, every activity is going to get a result. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then you have an activity here. And it's either going to get a check, or it's going to be classified as doing harm, or it's going to be classified as neutral. So the activities are checked as being green on one of the ambitions. And if they're checked as being green on one of the ambitions, they can then also get across somewhere else because they're considered to do harm on ambition number three. If you have an activity like uh, oil exploration, which is not positive on any of the six, then it is not assessed on doing harm. So there is a there's a logic is we assess activities that are green, and then if we find them to be green on one of the six criteria, then we assess if they do harm on any of the other six. If, however, we have an activity like coal mining, which clearly isn't good for anything yet, then the activity simply doesn't show up in the database as being in any way green, and then so it's not, it's not explicitly highlighted that it does harm on how many of the six. So, the important bit is, and we discussed it briefly before, this is not an assessment of companies, this is not an assessment of sectors. This is an assessment of activities. So the logic is a logic of you're financing a certain activity, you do not directly finance a company or a sector. Which means if you're a financial institution and a company comes to you to borrow money and it says, I'm in this sector, I think I'm bad, then you can tell them, wait a moment, what are all the activities you trade in? Maybe there's something where you're actually pretty good. The other way around, if you have a company coming to you and say, I'm in this sector, this sector is great, but they do a lot of not so clean business on the side, then you still ask them, so what's the purpose of these proceeds? What are you going to do with the money? And that is the big difference to anything you've seen before. So if you've heard terms like geeks or ICD, these sector classifications that force companies to be one company in one sector they will be a thing of the past. This is based on one company trading in a number of activities. And when you think about companies, most companies 
are involved in more than one activity. Some of the big manufacturing companies may even be involved in 25, 30 different activities. And so it really takes a company into its pieces from an activity perspective. Now, why is this important? The logic of the Paris Agreement is that we transform our economies from an economy that currently, on average, is non-sustainable <coughs> to an economy that is sustainable going forward and can renew itself. There is two main choices to this transformation. Number one, you basically shut down or shrink unsustainable businesses and you start new businesses from scratch. So that might work with Tesla, but it's not going to work with all things that we have to provide to citizens. So the much better route is you take existing companies and you strongly incentivize them to divest the activities which are unsustainable and to invest in those activities which are sustainable. So in many ways, you're not necessarily changing much to the management team, maybe one or two people, but not the whole management team. You're not necessarily changing something to the premises or the culture. All you're saying is you're an existing company, you were good at delivering business outputs, but in the past, whoever planned that 50 years ago, 30 years ago, didn't 100% think about the environmental implications of certain business outputs, so please consider divesting these and investing in other sectors which you as a company think suit your business models, suit your expertise, and focusing on other activities. So it is very much, and this is paramount to keep in mind, it's an activity game, it is not a company game, it is not a sector game. So what are the implications of that? Well, the implications of that from a financial institution perspective is that you get to know your partners in detail and you really understand their activities rather than having aggregate figures only. So you need to ask for more information at the activity level if you haven't done that already. And you need to ask for information on the legal structure underlying that, which you probably already do simply for governance reasons. So we're going to an activity level. The implication from a company perspective, if you're a corporate issuer, is that if you know you're involved in eight activities and your current accounting system doesn't facilitate providing individual numbers, try to facilitate that because the activities that are green may be getting a lot of preferential financing towards the activities that are not so green. So essentially it is basically squaring the logic of green bonds because it says if you're in green activities, the European Union's plans foresee that the bank that lends to the green activities is getting incentives on its equity capital requirements while the bank that doesn't lend to the green activities is not getting these incentives. So already in the frequently asked questions for the technical expert group, we have on page 10, second paragraph from the bottom, a very clear reference to equity capital requirements as very much a carrot for banks to lend to more green activities and to support lending because the, con the refinancing conditions for the bank will be preferential. Of course, you can extend that quite quickly to refinance conditions being less than preferential if you finance a lot of brown activities. So the overriding logic here is that central banks have interest rates as measures to affect the speed of economic growth. These new measures that we're developing are supposed to affect the greenness of economic growth. Does that make sense so far? Any, I feel a lot of any questions? Not yet? Okay. Questions are very welcome at any point in time, but also help me to adjust the... Talk. So we have the activities. And maybe just to explain that as well, if you haven't, if you haven't heard of this one... This is the Global Legal Entity Identifier Foundation. The data is free on the internet since May, 7, 2000, uh, May 8, 2017. And it's basically 1.5 million legal entities. And the legal entities are in a structure. So from an activity perspective, it's quite important that you have your corporate here. Let's take a German example. So Volkswagen. Volkswagen has all sorts of legal entities below it. So they could be Skoda Austria, Skoda uh, Czech Republic, uh, Skoda Spain and so forth and then Audi everything. So it's all these legal entities. The legal entities then themselves have a lot of securities that would be ISIN numbers. If they're a bank, there are thousands of them. And 
to know this structure is quite important because that's how you legally separate most of the activities. And the information is freely available here on that particular website to follow that up. So in many ways, it provides the regulator with more information on the greenness of the activities of the organization. It provides the organization with more information to get preferential refinancing conditions. It's nothing that has been is not unprecedented. So for instance, uh, we have Altria that already over a decade ago split the company in two because Kraft Foods was supposed to get better refinancing conditions that are not in any way hampered by Altria being a tobacco business. Yeah? So a lot of institutional investors in the US were not willing to invest into tobacco, but Altria happened to own Kraft Foods, so they decided to split it up so that the foods business could actually um, have better conditions than the tobacco business. So that's a quite relevant context to map out, and this is relevant for, for both. This is relevant when you're within the issuer, it's certainly relevant when you're in a regulator, and it's also relevant when you're in the financial institution that is actually borrowing money. Uh, sorry, lending money. So then, that's the benchmarks at a high level. Then the the next easiest thing to understand is the eco label. So the eco label doesn't actually need any new legislation because European Union eco label legislation is there. It's there for chairs. It's there for cars. It's there for vacuum cleaners. They simply use the same legislation that they already have and put it on top of financial products. So there will be a European eco-label for financial products, which probably in particular to retail customers will be quite attractive. It is implemented by the European Union's Joint Research Center, so-called JRC, and we actually have a summer school, July 1 to 3 in Milan, uh, where we train people on sustainable finance and the eco-label. The summer school is free of charge. People only have to pay their own expenses. So. You can find it on my LinkedIn profile, feel free to add me and then you can see the summer school as well and if you're interested you can come by. So we actually do some training around this um, and it's particularly targeted civil servants but anybody else is also very welcome uh, to apply. So that's the eco label. Then we have the benchmark. So the benchmarks have three parts to them. The number one part is the E, the S, and the G disclosure. So any benchmark that the investors use, and investors are particularly mean the big institutional end investors, so Dutch pension funds, Swedish pension funds, British, French pension funds, everybody that is driving this, it have to report on environmental, social, and governance aspects. So they will start to have to report on their carbon footprint, they will start to have to report on the gender on boards, they will start to have to report on social issues. And this reporting will be quite close to the investor disclosure reporting, and so thereby create an overall disclosure atmosphere. So the idea is that to incentivize people to start managing it, you have to start measuring it, and that requires reporting. The next aspect from the benchmark side is we have to create two indexes. And the other one is the Paris Align Index. So these are indexes that effectively aim to follow the same trajectory that you have in the Paris Agreement in terms of reductions of greenhouse gas emissions and that as such thereby incentivize the index providers to provide much stronger incentives for the corporates to remain in the index by reducing their emissions. These are not only equity indexes, so there will also be fixed income indexes and there will also be indexes potentially even in other asset classes. And so you can imagine hypothetically if a fixed income index class that is Paris aligned or EU transition gets very popular with investors then to have preferential refinancing conditions in the bond market, you have to be in the index because it means more investors are going to invest in you. So that's in essence the logic here that you're creating very strong carrots, again for companies to get their green activities refinanced at preferential conditions. And then 
equivalently, the investor disclosure is looking to connect with the disclosure we have in the benchmarks. So, in essence, the key question to follow is what precisely are the green activities? Huh? And to what degree do you maybe in the Forestry Association already have a lot of green activities? So, to start, what are the green activities? You can follow our friend Sean Kidney, who is also a technical expert and is very much the leading figure in the taxonomy group when it comes to content. Sean does most of these outreach uh, tours that we're doing today. Um, and so for instance, when we were in Beijing, he would say that the Toyota Lexus hybrid is not green in his view because it's not efficient enough, but the Toyota Yaris hybrid is green because it's efficient enough. That's the kind of fine line that he tees between the two types. And then the, he is running an organization which is called Climate Bonds. And Climate Bonds has a free taxonomy on the internet which is about 200 activities. So if you want to look how a taxonomy looks, the Climate Bonds taxonomy gives you a sense of what it actually is. In the Climate Bonds taxonomy, they classify into four different types. So they have things that are uh, green, they have things that are brown, they have things that are uh, need to be further researched if they're green or brown, and then they have things that are uh, not decided yet, that they're kind of not yet decided. So that's all very important. Let's start with the not yet decided. So the taxonomy aims at six ambitions, and they are scoring this bottom up. So they have 180 experts from all over the European Union that are gradually highlighting their views, which means they're only really finished with all six ambitions if everything goes according to plan in 2023. So we still have a bit of time to understand which, which ambitions are going to be how green. For the first ambition, however, the first draft will be ready this year. The total activities that they will be scoring in the end, in my view, will be 5,000 plus activities. So because they go in such level of detail, there will be an enormous amount of activities that will be scored. So how do they score the activities? Their first question is, of course, what is its overall impact from a climate change uh, mitigation perspective, for instance, what are the greenhouse gas emissions and so forth. But then another question that is highly relevant is the question, what is the substitutability? Like, what is the alternative? What's the benchmark if mankind wants to function more or less as it does? So to take an example, um, in terms of mobility, we have fossil fuel using cars, we have electric cars, so we have an alternative, or at least we've got hybrid cars. But when it comes to, say, cement, we have at this point no means of producing anything equivalent to cement that is completely wiping out our greenhouse gas emissions. We have technologies that are way more effective and efficient than the current standards, so we can probably get 60-70% efficiency gains but we won't be able to entirely avoid greenhouse gas emissions in the production of cement or equivalent and in while we can do it in horizontal mobility in aviation mobility we also are currently stuck in greenhouse gas emissions there's no way we can get out of it so another important point is the substitutability of the greenhouse gas emissions that comes to mind and then the third thing is of course to a degree politics huh? so one of the most significant questions out there is what happens to nuclear Technically speaking, no greenhouse gas emissions, but all sort of other potential problems related to it. And that's a heavy political problem that I will stay out. <laughs> so I'm not going to make any comment uh, on that. But so I would think of it conceptually. For instance, take forestry as an example, because we spoke before the event. For about 80% of the activities, it's pretty obvious if it's green or not green. Then you have maybe 15% where it's kind of, or 18% where it's more borderline, and then the last 2 to 5%, it's really on the edge. 
So when you are trying to prepare for this, then first of all getting the information systems to work on activity base rather than just on sector base would be my number one. Huh? So how can you prepare for this? Number one, collect information for activities. So that's number one. <coughs> then number two, you can check the climate bonds activities, if they already have a very clear green light, it would be quite surprised if you run into major problems. Huh? Because if they say this is definitely a clean activity, then it's probably already fine. So let's kind of check existing work. And then the third thing that I would recommend from a business perspective is Think about scaling, because as soon as there is a taxonomy and things are declared as green or not green, they become to a degree comparable. So you may have, from a financial institution's perspective, you may have loans that are very different sectors, but they're all considered green loans because they're generally good activities. Bundling them up could be quite attractive because pension funds look to invest in green loans or green bonds. So, and. If you start to think about that type of scale, it may become quite an attractive activity to leapfrog certain markets. And that is, I think from a taxonomy perspective, a very nice way to prepare for a changing environment. Any questions? You're talking about these six ambitions. What are they? Uh, climate change adoption, climate change mitigation, uh, healthy ecosystems, circular economy. The last two. Is it water or something? There's water, yeah. Yes. Uh, I, always, uh, I also have a problem remembering all of them. <laughs> but, um, it's page six. Do we have internet? It's the FAQ page six. If we, if we Google the... It, it could be clean air and water, that could be the case. Yeah. Something like that. So there are six ambitions and it's in the frequently asked questions on page five or six. And if you type frequently asked questions, you technically expert group. But in terms of timing, climate change adoption and climate change mitigation happen right now. And then we're going on to circular economy, healthy ecosystems, water, and then there's one other that we're just forgetting. About activities, so you mentioned there are 5,000 uh, 5, activities, panels. That's what I'm expecting that be. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then, uh, if I'm, let's say, if I'm financial institutions, we are lending to customers, and then all of them have different activities. So how to track it into our warehouse? So how do you really put it into numbers? Because uh, if there are so many activities, it's huge work to analyze all these transactions and then to keep this information. The data for this. And then the follow-up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's exactly that's exactly why I mentioned this today. <laughs> so let's talk about five thousand activities. Uh, let's talk about two things first. So we have Glyph. We have NACE. So NACE as European sector classification is the best starting point, but the activities are going way beyond NACE. So think of NACE times 5 or times 10, depending on how it's going to turn out. You have GLIFE with all the legal entity, legal entity identifiers. So you have the LEIs, and you have your NACE codes. And now, you have an additional challenge, which I'm sure will be your next question, which is the issuers don't actually report the activities at this stage on separate revenues. So you have very few issuers where you can see separate revenues per activities, quite often they're bundled together. So there is no clean way to split the activities at this stage. So we have to find, we have the activities here. We have to get the issuers to start reporting either separate revenues or separate employees 
or as some other form of activities. We have financial data science ways to proxy for that. For listed companies, we can proxy how companies are traded, how many percent are they traded like that, how many percent are they traded like that. But we need, say, revenues, or we need employees. Or something else. We need some sort of way of collecting them. So we have a very clear legislative force to get the taxonomy in place, but the European Union is a bit sneaky there, following capitalist approaches, which makes perfect sense. They say, look, we don't want to curtail innovation. So it's not on us to tell the banks how to sort out between the activities and uh, the companies. We're sure they're good enough. Now, I don't think anyone yet is in terms of financial institutions. I don't know a single financial institution that has all the activities tracked and gets all the uh, issuers to um, actually report to them accurately. That is where, technically speaking, the opportunity for leapfrogging is because it's not impossible. So in the academic laboratory, we can do that pretty much. It's not impossible to actually get this connected. It is just something which you have to prepare so that when we are looking at three, four years down the road, and this is becoming a very significant drive, you're one of the first to have the actual data systems ready. So what does that require? That requires an awareness on behalf of the issuers. That requires preparation for you that in your usual reporting with the issuers, you have a much closer way of looking at activities. And that requires, most importantly, some sort of weighting matrix how much of the issuer is meant to be for which activity. So one way of doing it is letting the issuer report the purpose of proceeds on everything. That way they tell it themselves how much they think they can actually put into which type of activity in terms of investment. And that's the relevant flow. But there is other ways as well. And that's where, at this stage, the taxonomy proposal does not give a particular answer. It simply assumes that it will be sorted out when the time is right, and then it's three to four years uh, left to sort it out. Do I think that it will be sorted out when the time is right? Yes, I do think there will probably be one or two institutions in most regions that will have it sorted out. Do I think that every institution will have sorted out? No. Huh? There's a lot of financial institutions that haven't invested in their IT back offices for decades, and those that struggle with that will continue to struggle. Because at some point you're just left behind on IT back office infrastructure. So in essence, here actually sits the opportunity, if you want to prepare for the green taxonomy, you can look at what's clearly green, what's clearly brown, and then you can look at how you bring up the reporting systems so that you will be much more agile in reporting on activities than others. Because a lot of that is, of course, going forward a documentation uh, logic. And if you want so, uh, one second, if you want so, you can think of the same thing as, we have an economy with companies, the way the economy is foreseen 10 years from now is an economy with companies that bundle activities. But it's really the activities that the regulator is concentrating on from a greenness perspective, not so much the companies. Um, under IFRS, there are quite requirements in respect of segment reporting. Mm -hmm. So why if corporate issuers can't report under segment uh, reporting those uh, activities, right? Green, brown, but not yet decided. Well, they, they can, they, so the segment reporting is of course to the corporate issuers, so if you rearrange your segments that one is clearly green, one is clearly brown, one is grey, one is non-decided, perfectly fine, you can easily yeah, do that. But that would be a very easy matrix for everybody, because uh, any corporate issuer is probably using the segment information, so just another uh, <laughs> dimension how to review this. Are you a corporate or financial institution? Financial institution. If you can convince your issuers to do that in large numbers? <laughs> You might be leapfrogging. So, to, to let's, let's be very honest here, right? So when we fly to Brussels, and being based in Dublin, unfortunately I'll always have to fly, it's not really realistic to take the train. The first thing you see is Equinor commercials, okay? So Equinor instead of Stad Oil, great marketing. I'm sure they spend 90% of the marketing budget on being green. But when you look at their CapEx disclosure, they probably have less than 5% of their capex in green and 95% plus in oil. And even or oil and gas. So there is a significant issue with the actual willingness on the issuer in this particular critical sector to be honest on the most important number, which is capex here. So 
e the largest funds in the world, such as the Future World Fund, are talking to the issuers, give us your cap capex numbers split up, and we are billions of uh, uh, billions of pounds invested by virtually any HSBC employee. Can we please get this? And the issuers, except for Shell, are quite shaky on this. So, um, if you can get the issuers to organize the IFRS reporting, pretty much like Sean's taxonomy, already clearly green, already clearly brown, questionable, needs more work, perfect. Of course, it's up to the issuers what they define as segments. And in many ways, if you have issuers maybe in forestry, that could be a great opportunity because a lot of that will be anyway green. So it's, it's kind of natural to probably organize that way. But that discussion, in essence, is need to be had on trusted relationships with the issuers. But to continue on from the point that you, you've made, essentially what the European um, level of this legislation is doing is to create a situation where issuers that will not be ready to be transparent will not be fundable on the market by the banks and, and the capital markets. We'll essentially be, that's where, where this is... Uh, we'll receive less preferential conditions. So mm -hmm. you can still, of course, find conditions, but they will be less preferential. So what this legislation is doing, it's creating a focus on activities, so from a data science perspective, it's going one level deeper than where we stand today. And that is useful even if you're not interested in green. Even if you just want to do your value at risk models, it is pretty useful to know your activity exposure because you want to know how these correlations clustering in the crisis and so forth. So it's first of all getting the whole data science infrastructure one level deeper, which if you have discussions with your executives about IT backend budgets is another reason to really get some. So, then the next thing is doing, it's based on this activity level, it's implementing a policy tool to navigate this, the, the greenness of the economic growth, the same way that interest rates are a policy tool to navigate the speed of the economic growth. And then the third thing, which is maybe the overriding thing, is that with the financial crisis, policymakers realized they had lost any touch of financial market activities. And green finance is a great way to get back in touch because what policymakers have been seeing, and this is also something where a marketplace like Riga should actually be relatively advantaged over a marketplace like London, policymakers have been realizing who are their biggest allies in financial markets. And the biggest allies of the policymakers in financial markets are the gigantic public pension funds. That's the biggest allies. Because the gigantic public pension funds have nearly exclusively the same ambitions as the policymakers. They are very interested in the policymakers' views and they have very antagonistic expectations to your classic uh, quick deal type investment bankers that don't really care what happened five years after the deal or three years after the deal. So, in essence, policymakers are using the pension funds and when you look at the tax structure, Sean is the guy that is basically doing most of the taxonomy details, but the guy that runs this from the expert members is an Australian operator by the name of Nathan Fabian. And Nathan is, is the chief responsible investment officer for the principles of responsible investment. So that will be UNPRI.org. So he's running that effectively on behalf of a lot of the global big public pension funds. And they added up together with support of some insurances are an enormous part of ownership of public markets and that is what the policy makers are linking into. So that's why, that is maybe worthwhile to mention, the division in DG FISMA that is doing sustainable finance has about 40 people and is quite regularly working on it, run by a, a Czech individual called Martin Spolk. And then there's the Italian uh, individual called Mario Nava overlooking it. But the same division that is running sustainable finance with 40 people is technically also in charge of fintech. Just that they only have about two or three people dealing with fintech. Because sustainable finance wins you votes, fintech not necessarily. <laughs> huh? And so that essentially is the situation where we're in. Uh, Martin Spoke plus 40 are running this, running this at quite some speed and have legislative decision-making power. So the level one is done for the benchmarks and the level one is done for the investor disclosure and is coming for the taxonomy in the next council. Yeah. You're talking about 
in the end of the day there will be 5,000 activities. That's my view. It could be 3,000, but it's okay, going to be about that. Uh, it, it sounds a lot, but in the same time it's uh, not so big number. For me, it's, uh, it's Quite, uh, quite hard to understand how you will divide them. For example, not forestry example, but, but biogas. Yeah. Biogas is of course better than natural gas, but also in that way we have discussions. If it is made from the agriculture waste, then it's okay. Uh, everything is okay. But, but if you are taking the agriculture land, uh, growing the corn, and then simply making biogas, but you have spent a lot of natural oil products, uh, to, to grow this corn, it's not so green anymore, or it is not green, to be honest. You, you believe that in these 5,000 <coughs> detailed activities, it, it will be said biogas from agriculture waste green, biogas from the corn brown or not discussed or something like that. In, so, in which way you will... Yeah, so, so I'm in the benchmarks group, so you yes. need to just keep that as a framework, but I would think there will be different versions of biogas in there, absolutely process, we have 35 members in the technical expert group. Of these 35, I think the biggest group is the taxonomy group, so that's maybe 10, 12 or so. And they have now called in another 185 experts to help them with all the different aspects. So at this point, the taxonomy is developed by nearly 200 people. And the level of depth is exactly the one that you were just discussing. So whenever I hear about it, it's got this level. like. Okay, we need to look at the whole value chain. This side of it is green, this side is not green, this side needs even further work. So, my view is that when you look at NACE, you have a couple of hundred on the lowest level of NACE. Take this times three or four, that's probably the amount of starting activities when we look at the taxonomy. Then, over time, as soon as you put out taxonomy proposals, what's going to happen? You're going to find some NGO that is a super expert on biogas and makes its own 12 activity, sub-activity biogas, and then you're going a level even further. So in essence, you start the activity classification systems, and then they will, over time, go even further until we have a relatively good understanding of the roots of these processes. Are we going to hit 10,000 plus soon? I don't think so. I think we're, we're talking 5,000 plus minus. But we will certainly go in a significant amount of depth, because the way this process is designed, maybe that's also important to keep that in mind, it's not only DG FISMA working on it, it's DG Klima working on it, DG Environment working on it, so the level of depth is going to be significant. The big difference with this process compared to the previous process that were single DGs is that now you have finance experts, Klima experts, environmental experts working together. So if you only have environmental ministries, it can happen that the project is great but the financial market can't use the information. If you only have finance ministries, then no one thinks about all the versions of biogas because that's what they don't know about. And so the combination of both means that there are people that anchor this into institutional investor behavior. So they say, you need to make it this way so that the pension fund can immediately act on it. There are people that classify what is green or what is not green at a very, very fine grain level. Then again, there are other people that anchor it into bank lending. And that's the whole idea of the particular expert group. So when you look at the setup of the expert group and the way it's done, is that we have everything from very detailed discussions on benchmarks, which, as Marie will be able to confirm, is really only three or four people that have these discussions at that level, to very detailed discussions on what is um, green in the taxonomy, to detailed discussions of how to incentivize issuers for green bond issues, to Americans flying in to Brussels to discuss with us TCFD and non-financial reporting. So the effort that is put in is quite remarkable. The outputs, as we can see them right now, are also pretty good. I mean, they're obviously not all there yet. But so, so far, um, the train is moving, the train is moving at a good speed. Have we yet arrived at all the stations that we aim to arrive? No, absolutely not. Are we far enough to say that we're going to change the way things are working? I would pretty much say yes. So from a practical perspective, are we far enough to say to the lady that you want to start preparing for activities? I think absolutely. Um, are we far enough to say that this is a leapfrogging opportunity for smaller financial marketplaces to try to leapfrog bigger ones? Absolutely as well. So there is a lot of opportunity, but of course the parts, as in any transition, are still moving parts because we're not only having the... And this is my last point, I see Maria is already ready to get in. So we're not only having the EU transition index 
from a climate transition perspective. We also have a mentality transition in financial markets. And the single biggest mentality transition is, for decades, we've been looking at corporates or sectors. Now we have to start to look at activities and see simply corporates as an umbrella for activities. As a corporate, you may say, if you're the CEO, well, this is slightly hitting my own power because I'm just the umbrella, not the corporate anymore. Well, at the same time, it's a great opportunity for you as a corporate if you have some brown activities, not to be seen as generally bad, but just having to divest the brown activities to move in the right direction. Huh? And so that's essentially the idea that ideally, as the lady in the back asked, all the corporates are now in Latvia market immediately moving all their segment reporting on IFRS to the greenness of their activities and we're looking perfect. If they're willing to do that, at least towards their uh, house banks, that will be fantastic. Huh? And so that's essentially where we stand and that will allow for a lot of green financing. And the demand for green financing and green bonds is clearly there. So there's a lot of institutional investor demand. Uh, Ireland, we had our first national green bond. We were three or four times oversubscribed. Most national treasuries Nowadays, if they have green things to finance, it's a great thing to do because the national green is pretty safe, pretty obvious. You're going to find something green to do, at least with some railroads in your country. And uh, so that's all uh, great opportunities. And so with forestry, you're probably actually largely on the nicer side of things. If green organizations will make this taxonomy, if they will make, then we will be brown. Who? For example, if, if, if this taxonomy will, will be made by the Green or environmental organization. At the moment, in the European Court, there is a question if uh, pellets uh, made from the wood is uh, renewable energy or not, to understand the level of discussions. And then, in the end of the day, what can I found out that sometimes oil products are more green than any wood product. Uh, it is in the PR mark, uh, made. Uh, Solutions. Then I, I don't know what will be in the end of the day. But as, as you are telling, uh, they are uh, real experts uh, in these uh, technical discussions, but not lobbyists, as green organizations or, or in industry organizations. So, so the so the so the expert group itself is. We have those three more minutes. Yeah. So, so the expert group itself is three types of experts. You have experts representing organizations. So that will be financial market institutions, issuers, some NGOs. Then you have experts representing a wider group of individuals, so that's pension funds. And then you have three experts, Sean, myself and Paolo, uh, just in, a, in our own capacity. We're just there for our own expertise, we're not representing anyone. I don't represent my university. Then the 185 additional experts that decide on taxonomy are drawn from a whole range of different associations. Everybody can participate in that in the future, I believe, just engage with the process and then when the next call for experts come out you can volunteer. If you want to start to look at where you stand with forestry, and I need to admit I haven't looked exactly at all the different parts of forestry, then I would look at Sean Kidney's uh, climate bonds classification which I had up here. And um, so if you look at the climate bonds classification you get a sense where you stand and then because it's activities and not sectors, there will be very very few sectors that are completely green, if any. There'll be very, very, well, there'll be maybe one or two sectors that are completely brown, although it's not formally assessed. So it's really the question, within your sector, which are the activities that are considered green right now? And then one of the things, just to make it slightly more complicated, you do, of course, have to consider that we're on a transition. So if you have a sector where right now you, consider, you get it as green, but it's already questionably green, then you need to see if it's still green in five years. Because but there is a transition and there are expectations. Huh? So in the in the Toyota uh, Lexus and Toyota Yaris example, the expectation is that the Yaris is actually going to get more energy efficient. If it doesn't manage to do that at some point, it may drop out from the green side. So it is it, it there is it's not a static target. It will be reviewed the taxonomy, and that means it will be slightly adjusted to the transition. So in that sense. Um, for the financial institutions, I would recommend to conclude engaging with activities and engaging with the recording and engaging with, say, our first segment reporting. From the issuer perspective, I would recommend engaging with which parts are clearly green right now, which are questionable and which are clearly not green, and then simply observing the dialogue and maybe focusing a bit more on those that are clear green. And then 
for the marketplace Riga, I do recommend you have the vice president of the European Union that is pushing this. That should be a competitive advantage, so you might be able to leapfrog it. Uh, you might be able to use it to leapfrog. So thank you very much. I hope it was interesting. Thank you.